Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski. Thanks for being with us tonight. And joining me on the line today is John C. Waugh, a fantastic award-winning author. We're going to talk about his new book, but John, welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here, even though you're way off somewhere else. <laughs> that's right. I can see the clock over your shoulder is a little, uh, it's an hour behind me from where I'm at. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're trying to catch up, but I don't think we ever will. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? There's never enough time anyway. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, a, a lot of people know uh, Jack from his uh, incredible book uh, about the West Point class of uh, 1846, a legendary class. And, and, and Jack, we'll talk about that in just a second. But you've got a new book out that I wanted us to talk about today called Unforgettables. Women losers or a winners losers, strong women, and eccentric men of the Civil War. Uh, and congratulations on the new book. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, and uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you who introduced me to a fine publisher. So this is uh, recently out from Savas Beatty, and uh, I've got to say, uh, Jack sent it to Emerging Civil War for consideration in in a different book project we we're working on and didn't quite fit there but i was like ah this is just uh i love this book and so i i talked to ted savis about it and we we're able to get it into production mm -hmm. i love this book jack <laughs> thank you right that's a real compliment so now it's uh one of the things i really liked about it it's a it's basically a collection of short biographies about notable and and less notable folks from the civil war right. era right right um, Tell me a little bit about how you pulled this collection together. Well, a lot of them, uh, in, in every case, I read stuff about them. And it, they, they just took my fancy. And I said, this is probably a book. I'll just uh, try to put the thing together. And so I picked out some of the some of the more interesting people that I'd met, met, I say, uh, through through doing books about the Civil War. I've done 12 other books. And uh, this one was just something that appealed to me as a group of people that uh, are just really interesting. And so uh, I, I started reading on them again because I'd, I'd done a lot of research with a number of them. But uh, it just seemed to me that some of these people are so interesting that they got to be written about and so i started writing and they they added up and uh, uh i'm just glad i found an outlet found a way to get published and, and a lot of these are people that are well known to civil war fans and and have long lengthy many long lengthy biographies about them right. um but what i really appreciated was just these are really short concise and readable uh entertaining readable uh, short biographies. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, it, it's a mix of long, long pieces and a mix of shorter pieces. And uh, uh, it just depended kind of on what I, the amount of my research. And if I had a lot, I had quite a bit on Abraham Lincoln. I even done the thing on him. To book. And, but it's not about him so much as, as I talked about his abilities as a writer. Uh, I think he's one of the giants of, uh, of of American letters, as well as being a great president. And uh, that struck me as as being worth worth uh, a pretty long essay in the book. It's not a it's not a a book that has a bunch of real short things. It's a mixture. There are short short pieces in it, and there are also long pieces. And uh, uh, it seems to be a pretty good mix. Yeah. And you have uh, some interesting groupings of people. You know, there's sort of a chapter, and a chapter will have, you know, four right, or five right, right. people in it. Um, how is it you you decided to kind of group these folks together, uh, you know, thematically? Well, uh, the thing starts out with uh, uh, there, there were three great senators in the uh, Civil War era, or in, in the the years before the Civil War. And that was uh, Clay, Calhoun, and Webster. And I wrote about each of them. And then I did a thing on Lincoln. I did a thing on on his wife, Mary. 
And uh, then I also did a thing on Jefferson Davis. And then I did some of the leading generals on both sides, uh, including, including, uh, excuse me a second. It includes uh, uh, Winfield Scott, who isn't really very familiar to a lot of people in our country today, but he was a great general, one of the great generals in the world. And uh, he was also the mentor to almost all the uh, generals that fought in the Civil War. They had all gone with him to Mexico when he conquered Mexico in the uh, uh, early days before the, before the the uh, Civil War, so it uh, the sources are buried, you know, and, and putting something together. And what I had a problem with is that when I wrote these things, it was generally uh, they were uh, speeches I'd given or something. I put them all together, but I what I didn't do at first was to a footnote of all of them, you know. And so I had to go back and footnote a bunch of stuff. I don't even remember where I got it. And uh, but we managed to do it. My wife and I managed to do it. And uh, uh, so it, it all turned out okay in the end. But uh, uh, my my advice to everybody is to footnote everything. I, I even footnote my... my uh, my weekly chopping list these days. It's uh, <laughs> it got to be done if you're a historian. You know, you've got to you got to tell people where you got this stuff. And uh, uh, of course, that's one of one of the lovely things about being a historian. You're telling a true story, and uh, if you can tell a true story and still keep it read, it, still keep it reading like. Uh, uh, a novel, I think you've accomplished something. Yeah. I'm not sure I ever have, but uh, that's what I look forward to try to do, is to write a very factual book, but make it read like a novel. So that's kind of my guide. It's it's interesting when you talk about, you know, a lot of these originated as talks that you'd given at points. And in that sort of format, you don't really need footnotes and then suddenly when you kind of put it into writing and it's like oh yeah wait where did that come from and, you know <laughs> yeah. and i find that with battlefield tours all the time you know yeah, nobody yeah, out the battlefield right. asking you for footnotes you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great yeah well it's it's a it's, it's starting to want to know where you got things you know and you know the public doesn't care so much but uh, you're writing not only for the public but you're writing for your peers and uh, so you have to take care. Yeah. You One know. of the things that, that you talked about, um, you know, sort of the writing style and making it engaging, uh, which I think you were really successful at. These are, you know, great little, almost self-contained nuggets, you know, and, and each yeah. one is like a, a great story unto itself. Um but one of the things I really liked is because of those groupings that we talked about a second ago, you sort of put these stories in conversation with each other in ways that I think are really illuminating. Um, oh, you know, cool. when you have that section about the presidents and their ladies and you've got, you know, an essay on Lincoln and you've got an essay on Davis, but you also have the first ladies. And so having them together then sort of puts all four of them in conversation. And then you bring Mary Chestnut into that because, of course, she had a, a lot of relationship with, with the Davises. And so, like, it's just a really neat juxtaposition. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And uh, uh, the thing about it, they're all so damned interesting. You know, they really are. All these people. Uh, and that's why I write about this era. But I just find the people so fascinating. And what they did and thought was so interesting that, uh, you know, you got to write about them. If you're a writer and <laughs> you want to be a historian, you know, and I'm just sort of a historian by accident. But uh, I started out as, as, a, as a journalist and I was on a newspaper, a Christian Science Monitor, for 18 years. And then I, and when, I when I left them, I started aiming toward doing history. Finally got there, and uh, it's a lovely, yeah. it's a lovely thing to do. It's an ongoing process for me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. I'm still, still trying to get there, right? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you, you do well, and you have a good base too at the university. 
Yeah, yeah. That's what that's a, a fine combination. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Tell me a little bit more about your writing career. Uh, you know, as a journalist, you know, that's certainly reflective in the voice that you write in because there is that um immediacy, there's that uh, engaging element to your oh prose that is easily understood which is you know those are all hallmarks of, of journalistic writing how did you make that transition from journalistic writing into historical writing i don't i don't think i there, there was much of a transition when i was writing for the christian science monitor for about 17 years uh i, I was writing thousand thousand word stories and then so i started writing history I wrote thousand word story every day, and uh, just the way it kind of fell together, and uh, that that seemed to work for me. And uh, but the but the thing that was new was footnotes. You know, I, that, that was took a while to get to get those in there, but uh, it's they're, they're so important. And you also had a career working for Nelson Rockefeller, and and you did some some uh, PR work for a United States Senator. How did that all kind of tie into your career too? Well, I was I was in New Mexico, uh, living there, and I needed a job. And a friend of mine who was uh, uh, in Washington said that Nelson Rockefeller needed a an an, an aid of some kind. In this special commission he headed up, the Commission for Water Quality, and uh, so I went had an interview with Rockefeller. He hired me to be one of two people representing him on that commission. And uh, I had the, the, the story that I love is the time that Nelson Rockefeller uh, uh, came into Washington for the special. A special airport out there for private planes. And he came up to me and we met him. And he came up to me and said, You have a dime. And I said, Yeah, I said, Yeah, I do. Yeah, sure. And so I gave him a dime and he went and made a phone call. And I never saw the dime again. But uh, you know, I have the, the prestige of having being of, of being panhandled by Nelson Rockefeller. <laughs> I never saw the dime again. I guess, and there's a great story about his father, who was the the original original Rockefeller. He was found by an aide one day groping under under his bed. He was feeling around under there, and the aide said, "Mr. Rockefeller, what are you what, what are you looking for?" He said, "I I lost a dime in here," and. Uh, the aide said, "Well, Mr. Rockefeller, you're so you're so wealthy. Why are you looking for a dime?" And he said, "He said, my friend, a dime is is the uh, interest on a on a dollar for a year, and that's important to me." And so he, so he, uh, you know, the Rockefellers an interesting group. They had they had five brothers, I believe. And each of them had a had a went into a different kind of, of a, a relationship. What they did, and uh, uh, Rockefeller or Nelson Rockefeller was a political guy. He was one to politics, and there was another one who was the uh, uh, gave away the money, and uh, they had they had jobs. These different Rockefeller brothers and. Uh, uh, I got to say, Nelson was very, very good to work with. And uh, I got in trouble with another senator because something I wrote about water quality in his state. And uh, Nelson came to my, came to my uh, uh, rescue. I mean, yeah. really, really loyal to his loyal people. <laughs> and, uh, an interesting, interesting thing about it. But he did love the ladies. And... Uh, uh, I know that when I when I was uh, I had an interesting interesting way to do it. I was assigned to set up a meeting in Atlanta, and uh, so uh, about the next day, when I was assigned this job, somebody came knocking at my door and said, "Hi, I'm uh, I'm Nelson Soundman," and then I got another 
guy came to the door and said, hi, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Nelson's advanced man. And they said, introduce, introduce themselves to me. But I didn't do a damn thing. You know, I was just sitting there watching these guys do everything. <laughs> he has had a group that were his, his uh, electricians. He had a group that were doing something else. And uh, sometimes he had two groups and uh, to make sure it got done. And uh, interesting the way that somebody like that works. Yeah. Wow. And it really is. Nice. And I guess it's always been the case. Um, so how did you make the transition from that into journalism? From from, from working or from, from working for Nelson uh, Rockefeller, from working for Senator Bingaman, um, yeah. you know, kind of being on the hill to being in the fourth estate. Well, I was in fourth estate first. Oh, were you? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And and then I, I came into that simply. It it wasn't difficult. You know, they uh they hired me and I was able to produce for them. Yeah. And uh it worked out it worked out okay. Uh Sometimes you don't know what you're doing, but you're doing <laughs> something, and uh, it generally works out. But he was a very nice man to work for, the Rockefeller, and, and uh, you know, Senator Jeff Bingham out of New Mexico, when he was elected, uh, he, he brought me on as his press secretary, and I was with him for his first term. He later served 30 years, 30 wow. years as a senator. He's still a young man, and uh, we go to Santa Fe. We visit with him. Stay oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So it's uh, and he was one of the guys who did things. You know, he wasn't in there to make a make a name for himself. He was in there to get something done, and that's that's a good kind of of a senator. Yeah. Uh, not like, all of, not all of them can make that claim to fame. <laughs> no, that's, that's right. Absolutely. <laughs> So um, how how did you make that transition into the Civil War? I mean, you, I assume you could have written about anything you wanted to. What attracted you to writing about Civil War? Well, I I was hooked on the Civil War when I was just a kid, just a kid, and I just love the whole idea of that and the drama in it and the irony of uh, of that period in time. And so I I was single minded about it. That's what I was headed for was to do. Do stuff on on the Civil War, so uh, it just it was one of one of the things I wanted to do, and I, I managed to do it. Grateful, very grateful. And and not only that, but like you wrote one of those books that I think almost everybody has in their shelves. You know, the the class of forty six is one of those books that I think was just so impactful, and it was seminal in a lot of different ways, and and you know. Everybody has it on their shelves, you know. Yeah. Tell me yeah. a, about writing that book. About the class of 1846. Yeah, tell you about how it came about. Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Well, I wanted to write a book on the Civil War, and uh, uh, but I didn't, you know, know too much about how I was going to do it. But when I was secretary and for Senator Bingaman, we were trying to do something about the Civil War in New Mexico. And uh, uh, whenever you had, whenever a committee wanted to do something on the Civil War, they called for the, uh, for Ed Bars is his name, B-E-A-R-S-S. And because uh, he is a living expert on the Civil War. And he was the, uh, the uh, head of the history or wing of the, uh, uh, federal government history of the battles and so and he just knew everything walking encyclopedia and uh, so Jeff asked him to come in and talk to the committee about this particular part of the Civil War and he came in and I went up to him and said introduce myself and said Mr. Bars I, I, I want to I want to write a book about the Civil War and you can almost see his eyes rolling or rolling up, and he said, well, "What? Uh, what's your theme?" That's the way he talked. What's your theme? And uh, I said, "Well, I got, but I, 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 I hemmed and hawed." And he said, "You got to have a theme." And so uh, I went back and looked at it, and then six of these stories involved people from this same class, 
1846, which which had uh, McClellan in it, it had had. Uh, uh, Need help? No, it's fine. No, I'm sorry. It had McClellan in it and Stonewall Jackson, and it was just a really a, a, an illustrious class. And so I zeroed in on that, and uh, that's basically how I did. I, you know, if he hadn't said I want a theme, then uh, I said I could have theme. Parse says theme. I better find one. So that's what I did. I found it, and uh, and it worked out. So. I, I really, I, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed doing the book. Yeah. What did What did you enjoy about it particularly? I, I think I think the irony. You know, irony is just fascinating, and the Civil War is full of it. Like things like brother fighting brother, you got a problem. Yeah. And it's it's a dramatic problem, and uh, so uh, that's that's basically what I was aiming at when I started writing the Civil War, was to find interesting stories and interesting people. And when I looked at the class and uh, found all those fantastic people in it, uh, that was my obvious thing to do, was to do a story on that class. And you got to spend some time with some interesting and eccentric people as you wrote that book, some of whom appear in your latest book. Mm -hmm. um, is there anybody from that, that class of 46 that you wish you could hang out with and just pick their brain about? Well, I'll tell you, yes, there is. And you probably, they, most of these people never heard of him, but his name was uh, George Horatio Derby. And uh, he he didn't get to the Civil War. He died just just after the, uh, uh, the, the battles around uh, Charleston, the opening of the Civil War. And, uh, but, but he was probably the funniest man in the army and uh, he was assigned to california which was a good fit for him and uh, then he started writing uh, stories about things about writing which was, he had a very interesting style and it was very funny and he started writing these uh, these things for newspapers but what he was sent to sent to uh california by the army was to uh to map out the, uh, uh, the, the the whole gold field area and do the mapping. He also went down first first man to white first white man to uh, see the uh, uh, where the uh, Colorado River flowed into the ocean, and he was first man to do that. He mapped that, mapped the gold fields. And uh, was was really a very interesting guy, but he, he got sick, and uh, he left California and finally designed uh, uh, lighthouses along the Gulf Coast and, and the uh, East Coast. And then he he caught, I think he, he had he had several diseases, and it took him in May of 1861. But I think he's the most interesting guy in the whole class. And everybody in the Army knew him because of the things he did and his hopes. You mentioned Derby, and he appears in your book. You you include him as one of a pair of wackos to kind of yeah, round right. out the book. He's, he I think, a really interesting choice is your last biography in the book, kind of a, a good choice. Yeah, that's, that's Derby. Uh -huh. And uh, he was a real fixture, fixture in California. And he did these strange things. He, he built a built a dam that did, ran parallel to the river rather than across it. And uh, he did wild things. He got involved uh, when the editor of a newspaper there went away for for uh, uh, a trip and left the paper in Derby's hands. He switched it around from being a Democratic paper to a Whig paper. <laughs> before, the, before the owner came back and uh, it caused kind of chaos but it was a, a gubernatorial campaign going on and he fixed that he fixed that all right <laughs> now he was, was a character and i i had to have that in the book so in your new collection um 
you know, I'm sure there you you probably could have made this twice as long because there are so many colorful folks. Oh, yeah. Was was there a process that you went through to choose who to keep and who not to, or anything like that? Well, yeah, but I I think I just I just sort of start thinking about it, and I would think about a person, and I said, "Yo, oh, I'd like to have that in there, and have him or her." And this also has about eleven women in it, so it's not just a man's mm -hmm. uh, a story about men in the Civil War. It's uh, about women also, and and some of them were real terrific. You know, they were some of them were wives of generals. And some of them were, were were making a name in their own right, but they're all interesting mm -hmm. and all very very strong women. So we began to uh, look at the best of those, and uh, came out with, a, with eleven of them, eleven different women. Yeah. And I'm glad I did because you know you don't find a lot of women sometimes in Civil War history. But uh, I was happy to be able to do it. And again, you, you put them in a conversation in, in pretty interesting ways, too, to show, you know, how so, how some of them were so in the mix of events of the day. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and some of them were very political. I mean, Sam and Chase's daughter was a, was a great political mind, so, as well as being beautiful. And uh, there were people like that that... Uh, women like that that uh, had great influence in the war and uh, uh, I was able to write love stories too so uh, and bringing the women into this and that it's just made kind of a nice mix as far as I was concerned was there someone as you wrote about them that um, you discovered something you weren't expecting that um, helped you see them in a new way Oh, I think I think Verena Davis certainly. You know, she uh, was married to uh, Jefferson Davis, and but she was she was not sold on the war at all, and uh, but you know she had to do what her what her what her husband was involved with, so she she went along with it. But she really thought the war was a tragic thing from the start. He said, this is going to be the way it's going to end up. And she was absolutely correct. She said, you know, the, uh, the, the North is going to elect Lincoln. And uh, then they will send my husband to be president of the Confederacy. And the whole thing is going to end up a mess. And uh, she said this. And uh, so it's what she believed. And... Uh, I think there were there were women in the South who felt that way, and she smuggled letters to a lot of her friends in the North. Talking about Rena Davis too, I mean, and and she thought the war would be a tragedy, and and she experienced personal tragedy by the end of the war. Oh, yeah, they, they lost a they lost a little boy. Their little boy who was five years old fell off of a. He was up on a a, a a high porch, and he fell down to the ground and killed himself. And uh, that was a, that, that just about undid Jefferson Davis. I mean, it was hard for him to even contemplate something like that happened. Yeah, yeah, you know, favorite little boy. And then I, Lincoln, oh, Lincoln lost Lincoln lost a boy too, and uh, uh, so that made a very interesting common problem that these two great men had. It's, there's a lot of tragedy in this thing. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, from top to bottom, from top to bottom. So is there anybody that you like? And one of the things I've discovered when I write about these people is like, I've got to, I've got to like them enough to want to spend an extended period of time with them to be able to write about them. Um, is there anybody that, that you, the more you spent time with them, you're like, oh, I just can't stand this person. <laughs> I can't stand them. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't, you know, I think I would have had a hard time with guys like, like Ben Butler, uh, and uh, who, who really was, there were, there were an awful lot of, of uh, hubris going on in some of these situations. And uh, I would certainly love to spend time with Lincoln. Yeah. And I'd love to spend time with, with uh, 
Derby. And uh, of course, I'd love to spend some time with with uh, a guy I didn't like too much, which is McCollum. And uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, whether they were good or bad, they were interesting. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to them many times. Yeah. I wish I could. I'm sure you feel the same way. Well, and I think about someone like Joe Hooker, who is like nobody I would want to hang out with on a day to day basis, but like I'm sure he was fascinating to talk to, you oh, know. Yeah. Well, um, loved it. Loved it. Yeah. Uh, you know, Dan Sickles, you know, same sort of thing. I don't know if I'd believe a word he said, but uh, boy, he'd be interesting <laughs> to talk to. Um, yeah, that's right. A lot of those people you can't, you can't trust them, but yeah. that's like, that's like any age. Yeah. yeah, well, that's true. That's true. I, you know, and I tell people, like, I'm a big Stonewall Jackson fanboy is how I describe myself. But, like, I don't know that I would want to hang out with him. You know, as someone I, I'm fascinated by and I'm interested in, but, like, yeah. he seems like he'd have been a pretty stern fellow um, to hang out with. Yeah, and he would, he, he would uh, seem aloof, I think. Yeah. You know, you know, it wouldn't have been a real friendly thing. But uh, he had his moments, though, you yeah. know. After they graduated, he he and another uh, grad fellow graduate from the class were were up in a room bouncing off the beds. You know, they were having a lot of fun. That was, that, that's not something you typically think of, of uh, when you think of a small Jackson. But you know, these guys had their moments. Yeah. And, uh, that's what I like about this new book. Um, and, and we're talking again about Unforgettables. Um is you find a way to bring in these moments of humanity for people that, uh, you know, we might think we know them. They might be marble men or, or, you know, classical figures. And you yeah. find these great moments of humanity that help bring them to life. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that's so important. I think, you know, as to, uh, the, the, the human beings are fascinating people. And when they're involved in something like this, a great war, I mean, uh, the stuff that comes out there is wrenching, you know. And brothers killing brothers, basically what it was. Yeah. And uh, uh, but underneath all these graduates from West Point, all of them were basically brothers. You know, they became brothers, the same as brothers. And uh, 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 that, to me, is a real irony. And uh, it's something that drew me to the Civil War since I was a kid with these fascinating people who who were involved in a situation that was uh, almost unbearable to be fighting each other that way. And uh, I know I think one of the, one of the interesting times was uh, in, in Appomattox after the war had ended, Grant was sitting on the porch of the house of the house that they were meeting in, and, and some of his generals from the other side, friends of his, always friends, and he was fighting them. But uh, they came up, and it was just like nothing happened. You know, they were still good friends, and uh, I think that that says a lot about the uh, the uh, value and the drama of of. Uh, that kind of situation it's pretty hard to resist that resist that because oh boy it, it's so full of drama and that's what history is you know it's just great drama yeah. and uh, i've been wanting to write in his about history since i was a kid and finally got the opportunity <laughs> and we are all better off for it i will say oh i think so <laughs> i gotta i gotta say your your help was just uh so wonderful. And I you know, thank you again. Uh, it's always a privilege to be able to help out someone who's done so much for the field and, and someone who's written such a neat book. So really the privilege was mine. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so Jack, uh, before we wrap up, anything about the book that I haven't asked you that you'd want folks to know? Well, let's think, let me think. Uh, no, I, the, the, the pictures, I have a picture of every one that I talk okay. about. And I think those those pictures are part of the fascination of this thing and what they looked like. And I I can look at uh, Horace Greeley here looking at the thing and shit, and they think of all this really weird stuff. He's he yeah. yeah stories about him, and they've all all of them have great stories. 
every one of them. And, and, and as I said in my book, you can get 40 more and 40 more and 40 more. And right. uh, uh, they're all that fascinating. But it was a pleasure to be able to write that book. And uh, uh, it was it's really a joy to see it under cover. Well, I hope people pick it up. It's called Unforgettables, Winners, Losers, Strong Women, and Eccentric Men of the Civil War by John C. Waugh. Um, Jack, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. I well, thank you. I sure appreciate it. And uh, uh, it's just a pleasure. Uh, thanks for being with us. I'm Chris Mikowski for the Emerging Civil War Podcast. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.